Okay, so the, the next presentation is actually going to be split in uh, two different parts. Um, and uh, so first I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Beasley, who is the Chief Technical Officer of Juniper's Platform Systems Division. And I'll let Michael uh, explain a little bit more about that, but you have such a, um, a large group of responsibility within, uh, within Juniper on the networking platform. So um, uh, anyway, we're pleased to have uh, Michael with us. Uh, and then, uh, so you're going to present uh, kind of Juniper's view on uh, OpenFlow and SDN, uh, and then we're going to shift over uh, to Jim Harding, uh, who's going to talk to uh, this from really a user's and implementation point of view. Okay. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. It's a very well attended uh, conference. In uh, this morning, as I was kind of thinking about uh, my my thoughts and one of the key messages that I, I wanted to communicate, um, I got to the, the fundamental question of, of whether from, a, from an equipment vendor point of view, like Juniper, whether we see SDN as the end of networking as we know it, or rather the beginning of a, of a new phase. Um, certainly there's a, a, a lot of things changing in the, in the environment, uh, in the overall IT ecosystem being driven by, by many different forces. Uh, certainly there's the, the consumerization impact of IT, the, the bring your own device aspect of, of modern networks. Um, and there's the, the trend of virtualizing resources, both uh, you know, compute, uh, storage, and ultimately the network itself. Um, our view is really that, that what is underpinning this is the network itself. It actually is the glue that really makes all of this uh, work together um, and be able to provide these, these innovations and provide a platform on top of which these changes can occur. And a as a consequence, we think that this is a, a, a great opportunity um, uh, for, for ourselves as, a, as equipment vendors to uh, add value to the equipment and to be able to play at the solutions level um, uh, going forward. Um, really, what's underpinning um, that is two basic trends. The, the scope of the network itself is ever increasing, uh, covering data center, LAN, um, uh, mobility and Wi-Fi, as well as the, the WAN. Um, and the second big trend is really the, the, the requirement for dynamic workloads, where compute, storage, and network is, is viewed as a, a resource pool that is elastic, that is easily provisioned, that is automated, um, and probably most important, cheap to run. Uh, certainly in, in you know, the customers that I, I, I talk with, you know, CapEx is continually a, a, a concern, but really the focus going forward is on operational cost, on application agility, service agility, and actually ways to, to, to monetize the, the network itself. Um, in, as we look at the situation, we do realize that what, what is needed most of all is a good programmatic interface between the application layers and the network uh, layers. Uh, today, we really don't have the, the, the mechanisms and the, the protocols uh, to, to pass useful information at the right levels of abstractions from the application side into the network and then from the network side back up to the application. And I think going forward, uh, SDN has the, the promise and offers technologies and, uh, and approaches that can really uh, close that application to network divide. You know, with regard to, to really being able to program the, the network and applying, uh, you know, the knowledge that is there, it really breaks down into understanding, you know, several key things. Certainly, the, the, the physical world has, a, has an impact. You know, the, uh, distance matters, speed of light matters, uh, locality and affinity uh, actually matter. And really, to, to orchestrate and program and provision a network efficiently, you really have to, we really have to understand that aspect. The second uh, thing that is, is vital to understand and to be able to facilitate is the, the information with regard to topology and, and path through the network, um, whether that reflects uh, assurance levels, um, security policies, uh, congestion, and so forth. And, and the third part, which I think is, is one of the, 
um, if, I, if I look forward to, to how SDN technologies can really improve the, the state of the ecosystem, the, the third piece is critical, which is actually allowing applications to indicate to the network what they want to do and what the actual uh, intent is. Today, networks are, are, you know, we've developed a lot of technology that kind of probes and, and as a kind of a look-aside mechanism is trying to figure out what an application is actually uh, attempting to do. Um, I, I think the world is more ideal if we have uh, programmatic interfaces at the right level of abstractions that allows um, um, an application to actually indicate ahead of time to the network what it, what, what it would like to do, what the application is going to do. Um, and then also have a, an ability to, to have information reflected back off of the network to give uh, indication to the applications on whether that would be successful or whether that's the most cost effective thing. Uh, certainly, as, as we build out uh, you know, sets of bi-directional APIs and protocols, it's worth really keeping in mind that we want to, to enable that high rate of change uh, uh, at the edge of the network to allow the, the virtualized resources uh, to be provisioned and to be used in a, in, a, in a very effective, very timely manner. At the same time, on the transport side, we really want to be able to publish topology um, and instrumentation and be able to actually program the, the, the topology and the path through the network. Um, you know, when, when we think about uh, network prog programmability at, at, at Juniper, we do realize that it, it, it has to occur at, at multiple layers. I would say so far in the, in the industry in general, we've maybe focused at a, at a lower layer, really focusing at the, at the box level and the element API level. I think going forward, the focus really needs to be around, around workflow um, so that we can ha provide the programmability on a per workflow basis and create the right layers of, of abstraction to allow the useful information to be passed back and forth through the layers. Certainly over the decades that we've been uh, uh, building uh, equipment and solutions, we've come up with a number of tool, uh, tools in the toolbox so far uh, to be able to provision and program networks. Um, uh, they're, they're, you know, they're very useful tools. They've, they've been, you know, they've got us to where we are today. I think going forward, what we would be most interested in in the area of SDN is getting to a point where we have tools and protocols that can really facilitate both a high rate of change as well as high layer levels of, of abstraction to really facilitate the automation and the, the provisioning of, of network and network resources. You know. Um, when we think about you know, abstracting um, uh, the network and, and facilitating, facilitating programming at the edge, um, it's really all about where, wh which resources are attached, who is allowed to speak to whom, um, and abstracting the connectivity details away from the resource orchestration. Really, SDN and OpenFlow in particular allows us to move from a, a, a more static provisioning model to, to more timely and dynamic. On the transport side, it's really about abstracting topology and being able to manage the path of communications and actually dealing with the, with the physical realities that always ultimately come to play um, as, as we communicate, whether it be applications or machines or, or people, ultimately the physical world does actually come to play. Um, and I think there it's really about abstracting the path details away from the connectivity layer. layer. And moving forward from a more static configuration world that we have up until now to a, a software-driven world um, using uh, technologies such as BGPTE and stateful PCE to really facilitate. So with regard to how we, uh, how we get there uh, going forward, uh, I think there's really two tracks to it. The, the first is um, architecting and building systems that are, that are more powerful and address the, the fundamental needs uh, of the actual network itself. Uh, we, we heard earlier that you know, a, a, a fabric connectivity is extremely valuable, and certainly um, uh, products like QFabric, they offer that. They offer a flat, universal bandwidth, universal connectivity solution with a, a, a single point of, of management. So, 
the, the higher level orchestration and, uh, systems, the controller systems, uh, don't have to, to uh, scale out uh, to an extreme level with, rec with regard to actually managing equipment. And I think we'll, we'll certainly we believe at, at Juniper that, that this is a, a way we can really bring technology uh, to bear and we can bring uh, products to market that really play in a, in a software-driven network where the, the actual aspects and the attributes of the products themselves add extreme value, add significant value in upon themselves, regardless of the, the abstractions and the orchestration systems that might, might be used on, uh, on top of the system. I think the second track is to really facilitate as an industry, and, and you know, uh, Juniper is, is, has a significant involvement with regard to the, the equipment side, but also on the, on the software side. I think the second track is to really pursue uh, a single point of programming such that, that a, a controller is able to, to orchestrate, provision, manage, um, and monitor a broad set of the actual uh, equipment underneath that are, are used to put together a full solution. That would, that would cover everything from WAN gateways to uh, L4 through L7 services and, and security, Ethernet fabrics, whether they be you know, converged uh, uh, or not, and really uh, providing that controller platform, uh, facilitating the, the, the lower operational cost of managing that network and that kit but also facilitating very rich and well abstracted northbound APIs that allow significant functionality to be put on top of the, the controller in, a, in an easier, quicker manner, such that the, the, the abilities of the underlying network and the, the equipment in the network can be more readily uh, um, harnessed and, and used. Um, certainly, from, from our, our perspective, we really feel that the that the, the, to get the full value out of, out of software-defined networking and the te technologies therein, uh, as an industry, we should you know, move forward and, and work together on really bi-directional communications to allow uh, the application layer to signal uh, more completely to the network, as well as the network to signal back to the application layer with regard to uh, what is available uh, and what is the, the status of the, of the network. Um, that's pretty much my uh, segment. I don't know whether we wanted to go to Jim straight away or... Uh, so Jim, uh, Jim Harding is the president of uh, Kadanis and also the CTO of Sebi Data Centers. Jim, could you add some color uh, to that, you know? I'll give it an attempt. Okay. Great. Thank you, Michael. After you. Going to cover three areas with you quickly today. Also, a perspective on uh, SDN. We look at SDN as uh, new types of networks. It's not necessarily a, a major game changer or the Schumpeter's creative destruction. It's really an enabler for that. So, what we're excited about is uh, new types of networks that are programmable at scale. So, everything has to be at scale. So, we've got a, a few businesses here. One is Sabi Data Centers. We're the, about the largest private data center company in the United States. We just bought this. Uh, large scalable data center. It's considered the third ugliest building in, in the country at a recent MSN poll. It's at 375 Pearl in Manhattan. And this represents scale. It's also a greenfield opportunity. So we took this building, there's nothing in it. Moore's Law took it from 32 floors of, of telco, telco switching down to two floors and we took the rest. It's all going to be networking now for our, our tenants. And what we needed was a, a class in a box type thing. So if you think of a greenfield with a large data center, a million square feet, if you really wanted to do class at scale, you want it in a box, you don't have to go wire that yourself. So we, we uh, partnered with Juniper and got the, one of the first um, automatic linked enabled classes with the Q fabric. And in our building, um, so much of stats on this thing, but the, thing, the three things I want you to think about is that we're now in a green field where we're planning uh, SDN for an optical cross connect coming into the building. Uh, meeting rooms are fine, they're old, It'd be much better to control them with software. Uh, we're doing planned SDN top of rack services with a number of customers we're negotiating with right now. Now top of rack service is what is uh, next to come in networking, to control that with software uh, and let them bring their infrastructure underneath that. 
and we want to have low latency throughout that building. So that's an example of scale. We've got three and a half million square feet. This is a million here. We're connecting them together throughout the country, and SDN is a key part of our strategy. Uh, but there's this sort of missing management play, and you've got the you got the class and you've got the top of rack, and you got uh, we're working through a VMware and an OpenStack solution. We're integrating um, SDN with with these solutions and, and Hadoop, and we need to manage that across the, the stacks. Um, so in order to do that, we need an SDN controller. So we've been working with uh, Big Switch to work on our integrated uh, cloud platform strategy and deploying that into our data centers. And it allows us to take the fabric and with these enabled switches, connect that together. Now, uh, most of us here aren't doing SDN right now as a full deployment because it's new. Um, the course of my history, I did, uh, my first company was uh, MS-DOS. We built uh, cell computer products. We built MS-DOS, sold at the gates. We took you know, chips from Intel, wire wrapped them, got an S100 bus together and shipped that out the door and Microsoft took it from there. I worked at Amazon where we built the um, third party reseller platform. We just dumped, jumped into that thing, get out of books and music and get into everything else. We need, a, we need a hundreds of millions of users buying through Amazon and we need to have um, hundreds of thousands of resellers. How do you build a platform that at scale? You know, we didn't know how to do that. We just did it, move forward. What I'm here to tell you is that we can all move forward in this stuff. There's things we can do. It's not all here yet. Uh, but there's a lot of vendors putting things together and uh, making this make sense. Um, so what we need to do is take that, these SDN type controllers, mix them into our, our, um, our racks and our stack platform. And then we have to connect that, interconnect that nationwide. So it's high availability. And um, as a term I would like to introduce into um, this conference, uh, it's, a, um, it's a term that's used in biology Biology went from uh, biology to systems biology to network biology. The new term, the buzz term right now in, in biology is multi-scale. And, and looking at biology in life, you look at a multi-scale networking problem with high availability. So not only do we have to build these SDN systems at scale inside our data centers, and when we have greenfield, that's nice, but we also have non-greenfield. Um, we're doing a joint venture with Providence Health. It's a $11.6 billion health uh, services system. And we decided to turn that entire system into a platform and resell those services back to, to healthcare. And as we saw earlier from Eric, um, he is the, the use case of how difficult it is to do networking inside of these large hospital systems. What if we get together and start building services around that so we can make it much easier to deploy networks through these large systems? Um, so, you know, we really don't have these great controllers running at scale right now, but we need to get them running at scale, you know, across the world with high availability. How are we going to do that? So that's what we're here for, to solve these kind of problems. And then we have vendor integration challenges. We have, uh, first of all, we have to get the, the switches to be enabled. We're seeing a lot of those coming online now. Uh, we need to integrate these, these switches into our stacks. And we need to manage this through our fabric. And if it's not, not, if it's not enabled, we can do overlays and tunneling through that. You know, like an MPLS, just, just overlay and tunnel right through that. So we can do that now. Uh, and we are attempting to do that now. Um, and then we'll let the vendors innovate around Open vSwitch and all their derivatives because it's going to make it softer and softer and more programmable, more programmable over time. And then our job is to run it at scale with high availability uh, on these HA-based controllers that will come one day. And uh, all of us need to really think about where SDN's going. It's really inventing new network types. I'll give you one example. In, in healthcare, um, as Eric was talking, you know, security is a major problem. Um, SDN allows us to think about new ways of building new types of networks. We can't just do same old, same old. We have an opportunity now where if we get into an instruction-oriented world where we have these controllers that we can access to all of our hardware, we can look at everything going, we can do interesting things with IPsec and protocols where we can secure things. And the way I like to look at the applications and security of the future is to say, if you have a network and this is some application I have, I want to secure this application. I just need to put it on that network. I need to provision that network on the fly, construct and deconstruct them with provisioning. So that's really where we're going, and we're doing some uh, attempts internally right now on how to make a, a, a new type of secure network to run inside of healthcare, and it'll apply for other um, industries as well. So this, this new term is multi-scale, so I, I'd like us to think about that, because biology has moved through this to this new term. Uh, one of the... Um, crazy, just out there, uh, computational biologist Eric Schatz on his door in New York City, all about multi-scale biology. Um, it's a new class, a way of thinking about this larger problem. As we've gone from these 
epochs, um, one and two, and into this three. I want to take us back to the, the first epoch, when networks were working long before we were around. And when we start looking at that and decompose all these components, we're realizing this is an order of 10 to the 20th in terms of components working even on a human body. And at, at 10 to the 20th, with all these different system layers and network layers, we're dealing with what we'll call a multi-scale. And I think SDN is entering into this new epoch, which is multi-scale networking. So we're really looking for, looking at uh, this class in a wet, wet box, biology box. And instead of automatically scaling these links, when you have something like a Q fabric where you have one management interface, everything's taken care of behind you, I can't afford to go and spend all this time putting all these, um, to put a class type fabric together. I just need it in a box. Um, so as we go forward looking at technology, we should look at things on how biology has done stuff, because that's the inspiration here. And rather than automatically, it's auto autonomically. So autonomically, so for example, if I, I throw this piece of candy over to my buddy Michael over here, the network that caused that to happen was an automa autonomic response. Billions of cells and stuff were working together in the various types of networks to make that thing happen. We need to move from manual networks to programmable networks to cognitive networks, which are moving into, into autonomic networks, which happen and heal themselves automatically. So there's inspiration. It's working. Every one of us has these systems running today. And when we look at this, uh, an SDN, multi-scaled, multi-stage networking system, if you look at the human system or any life system, you've got a central nervous system uh, moving through all these various other, net, these other systems. That's what we're talking about, new networks. The internet's been around a long time. All kinds of new networks need to be created. When we have instructional programmable type environments, we can create these new networks and all kinds of exciting things that come out of this. Um, just interestingly, the, uh, the layer one's uh, central nervous system is protected by bone. The peripheral nervous system is through a cross connect off that into all these other devices. So think of nerves as this you know, very elegant edge device signaling transport. That's what's going on. Just think about that. That's where we need to be looking. And by the way, it's all instruction based. This is not hardwired. It starts with one cell, splits many times. End up with 100 trillion cells and everything works. Uh, and then we get down into the cell. There's these things called microtubules that uh, they get provisioned and they're torn down automatically as the needs and, and the signals of the cell come into you. And so microtubules are moving, transporting large amounts of proteins from one part of the cell to the other. So in multi-scale biology, we're looking down to the, the protein up into the cell, cell to cell, uh, functional unit to functional unit, system to system, network to network. This is where we need our inspiration. Uh, the first two epochs were great. Go back to zero epoch, analyze this, and it gets a little more exciting. In healthcare and life sciences, when you put them together, what you're looking at is uh, you're looking at networks that go wrong. Alzheimer's is unfortunately a problem when a, a microtubule starts to fray, and you're losing packets, literally. And that packet loss causes this disease. And so in life sciences, where Codonis is working, we're trying to build um, scalable cloud technology, a networking-oriented cloud technology to hook a number of institutions together to share data and then apply that translationally over into the healthcare system. It's all about understanding networking better. It's all instructions. Um, and it really is all SDN based. It's all symbols, it's codes, it's instructions, and it's protocols. And life is actually open source. If you look at your DNA, it's, it's, all, it's all there. The problem is no one on the planet understands a single one of the instructions. So we understand the symbols, we understand the codes, but how those things work, how those genes work, there's regulatory genes, there's, there's proteins that are get coded for this thing. We need to understand those instructions. We will understand them more. Unfortunately, it's at base 64, so it's a little, little beyond our base two reach right now. And the, the last thing I'd like to leave you with is that uh, the inspiration behind SDN, at least for me, is to look at, at what we've been doing with technology by looking at biology. So I, I consider this to be a digital life virtuous cycle. The more that we understand biology, the better we make technology. We can see how it scales, we make it better. The better we make technology, the more we understand biology. You know, we, these sequencing machines now that we've built through technology by looking at biology, we can, we're down to sequencing a gene uh, down around $1,000 now with the Life Technologies Ion Torrent product. Um, it's getting very exciting, and, and, and with that, the more we apply technology to biology, the better we can live. And SDN's a new enabling technology in this cycle. Thank you. My Please. question is for uh, Michael Beasley. I thoroughly endorse 
your proposal to have bi-directional APIs from the application layer to the network. But the question is, who's going to standardize those and make those open? Now, as a point of reference, I'd like you to consider that there are no standard or even common APIs for cloud computing. <coughs> Something as simple as provision a new link between a virtual, virtual machine in a remote cloud data center and my customer premise is not standardized. How's that going to happen with software-defined networking? What's the process? It's going to be uh, Dan Pitt's foundation or something else? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's a, it's a very good question. I, I do, uh, I think that collectively that's probably one of the biggest work items that we have in the industry to make sure that we can move forward and actually get to truly standardized, truly open interfaces to facilitate this and to avoid, uh, uh, how shall we say it, local optimizations that uh, you know, w we might individually uh, uh, attempt uh, to, to get a, a, a shorter term advantage because I think the, the longer term advantage is, a, is a, a tide that lifts all boats. I really think you know, today we're on, we're on a track for, for it being, to, being a collaboration between several standards bodies, um, but I think collectively it's something we have to work on and, and improve going forward. Yeah. Jim, do you have any, you know, anything to add? Is there a biological? It well. I'm sorry? He answered it well. Very good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay great. Um, any other questions? Everyone's hungry for lunch. Um, please um, help give me a round of hands. Oh, a round of hands for both Jim and Mike. Thank you, guys. <laughs>